four, and uh, we'll, we're going to start with a side-by-side -side, uh, walkthrough, and then take uh, public testimony, Oops, sorry. and then some discussion. We don't expect that we will finish today. We expect that we will uh, listen to concerns and input, and then come back on another day um, to try and uh, resolve any uh, issues that are uh, brought forth this morning. So uh, uh, Ms. Pontius uh, has another uh, commitment, so we're going to have Mr. Gehring go through the side-by-side -side, uh, for us. I'm also informed that Senator Limmer may join us to discuss particular uh, sections of the bill that he's concerned with. So Mr. Gehring. Uh, Madam Chair, so I'm going to do a walk through, walk through of the side by side, and we don't have a, a formal summary prepared. Although Ms. Levholtz did a, a handout that should be in your packet if you want to follow along with that handout, so I'll be working off the actual side by side document with the the bill text. Uh, so on page R1 of the side by side, the first section is a Senate only section. This is a section that uh, requires that uh, government entities prepare an, in, an inventory of surveillance technology that's maintained and used by the government entity. Uh, and this inventory list is required to be submitted to the legislature by January 15th of each year. Uh, and so it would be submitted to the committees uh, with responsibility over data practices issues. Uh, my understanding this is a, a piece of language that is an amendment from Senator Limmer in the Senate. Uh, there's no House uh, companion section to that section. Um, also on page R1 is uh, House section 1. Uh, this is a section that comes from um, a separate bill of Representative Holbrooks that uh, regulates uh, data breaches and this language and a number of other uh, pieces of language in the side-by-side -side come from a bill that's also in a different conference committee currently so um, so uh, um, so we'll hear it in both places I guess um, so uh, how section 1 on page R1 is a requirement that responsible authorities establish procedures uh, for ensuring that uh, not public data are only accessible to persons whose work assignment reasonably requires access uh, and then um, also develop uh, procedures including uh, model policies governing access to data if uh, data is shared with another entity. I'm starting at the bottom of page R1 and then mostly on page R2 is House Section 2. Uh, which is modifying section 13.055, which is the data breach section. Um, so cur under current law, uh, there's a data breach procedure uh, in law for data breaches at a state agency. Uh, the section would expand that to cover all government entities, including uh, local governments. Uh, at the bottom of page R2, subdivision 2, uh, there's an additional investigation report that would be required to be uh, posted um, uh, in the event of a data breach at a government entity. Uh, on page R3, uh, subdivisions 3 and 4 are conforming changes that, uh, as I mentioned, expand the scope of the data breach section from just state agencies to all government entities under the Data Practices Act. On page R4, section 3 on the House side, uh, as an expansion of the penalties under the Data Practices Act uh, to include penalties, um, uh, uh, criminal penalties for uh, uh, persons whose conduct uh, constitutes the knowing unauthorized acquisition of not public data, um, and then also uh, expands a, a, um, a penalty that would uh, apply to a public employee um, for any action that would be subject to a criminal penalty, including the knowing unauthorized acquisition of not public data, um, and the public employee could be uh, subject to uh, suspension without pay or dismissal for any of those actions. At the bottom of page R R4, House Section 4 and Senate Section 2 uh, is sort of the meat of the license plate reader uh, sections. Uh, so on the House side, the House defines uh, on lines 4.23 to 4.25, uh, defines the term automated license plate reader data. And on the Senate side, the Senate defines the term automated license plate reader. Um, you can see that on lines 2.1 to 2.5. Um, on lines 2.6 to 2.8 on the Senate side, uh, the Senate defines uh, automated license plate reader data as um, confidential data if the data are uh, active criminal investigative data. 
on page R5 at the top of the page uh, on the House side, uh, lines 4.26 to 4.31. Uh, the House classifies license plate reader data as uh, private data or non-public data uh, and then um, provides that the data is prohibited from being retained unless there is um, a hit uh, that suggests that the um, data is showing the identity of a vehicle or license plate that has been stolen or there's a warrant uh, or, uh, for the arrest of the owner of the vehicle or the owner has a suspended or revoked driver's license um, or the data are active investigative data. So unless one of those circumstances exist uh, in the House language, um, the data are prohibited from being retained. <coughs> Uh, the Senate has a little bit more complex structure because, um, uh, partly because the, um, the Senate's language uh, provides for some retention of the data. Uh, so there is a classification of um, uh, private or non-public data for certain types of uh, license plate reader data, including license plate numbers, uh, the date, time, and location of data, uh, location data on vehicles, uh, and then also pictures of license plates, vehicles, and areas surrounding the vehicles. Um, the Senate language starting on line 2.14 uh, provides that the, these data must be destroyed within 90 days of the time of collection of the data unless it's uh, active criminal investigative data. Uh, but then also includes an allowance for a program participant in the Safe at Home program uh, to request that the data be destroyed immediately. Um, towards the bottom of page R5, starting on House uh, line 4.32, um, and Senate uh, line 2.24, both the House and the Senate require that um, law enforcement agencies maintain a log of license plate reader use. Um, there are some generally sort of uh, stylistic differences in the way that these two sections are structured. Um, one uh, sort of substantive difference is that the House um, requires the log to include all locations at which the reader is installed or used, which you can see on line 5.1. And on the Senate side, the Senate only requires the log to include uh, readers that are used at a station, stationary location, which you can see at line 2.29 uh, to 2.30. Uh, both the House and the Senate both require uh, a biennial audit of data collected from license plate readers. Uh, on the House side, a responsible law enforcement agency is required to conduct the audit. And on the Senate side, the Department of Public Safety would conduct the audit. Um, additionally, on the Senate side, um, uh, the language requires that uh, lo the law enforcement agency maintain records showing the date that data are collected and whether the data, data are classified um, either as private data or as confidential data uh, as provided earlier in the bill. And you can see this language on, uh, on the Senate side in lines 2.32. Uh, to 2.34. On um, page R6 at the top on the House side, uh, the House requires that uh, uh, law enforcement agencies implement policies and procedures necessary to ensure compliance with the requirements of uh, license plate readers as provided in the bill. Uh, the Senate has a little bit more expansive uh, language here, uh, starting on Senate line 3.3 through 3.17. Uh, the Senate requires that, um, that uh, uh, certain sections of the Data Practices Act apply to the operation of license plate readers. This includes the uh, data breach notification sections and then uh, requirements that um, the government entity and law enforcement agency have data protection and security policies in place. Um, and then the Senate also includes uh, language requiring that uh, the law enforcement agency have written procedures to ensure that uh, law enforcement personnel have access to the data only if authorized in writing by the chief uh, uh, sheriff or the head of the law enforcement agency uh, and that the, um, the access to the license plate reader data is for a specific law enforcement purpose. Um, the Senate, sorry, on line, uh, line 3.10 on R6 also requires uh, uh, law enforcement agencies that install or use a license plate reader to notify the BCA within 10 days of installation or current use of the reader. Uh, then requires the BCA to maintain a list of law enforcement agencies that have these uh, systems in place, including the locations of uh, stationary license plate readers, except uh, to the extent that it would reveal uh, security information. And then this list would be required to be posted uh, on the BCA's website. Uh, the Senate also has an effective date that provides that uh, data that was collected before the section is enacted must be uh, destroyed um, no later than 15 days after the effective date uh, if the policy substance of the bill would require that the data be destroyed to begin with. 
And then finally, the last uh, house standalone section is house section five, uh, starting at the bottom of page six and running onto page uh, R7. Uh, this is language that requires um, the names of uh, law enforcement agencies that submit data to the cybers database uh, and the general description of the types of data submitted uh, to be public data. Madam Chair, that's the end of the side by side. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gearing, are there any questions for Mr. Gearing? Um, I have a question for the Senate on the uh, issue of stationary readers, and I might have missed it. Is that defined somewhere that it has to be? Uh, I mean, what constitutes a stationary uh, reader? There for 24 hours, there for more than a week? No, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the way we look at it is a stationary reader are those that are designed to be a stationary reader. Like, for an example, in, in North Minneapolis, I think they have a stationary reader where it just stays there uh, that's on, like, the Lowry Bridge. And that's different from, um, let's say, a mobile unit where m there may be one in a police car versus uh, th there's another unit where it's not necessarily in the police car, but they move them to different locations. So um, I don't, I can't recall, and I'll double check if we have it defined. But but I thought we attempted to, and and we can hear some testimony from law enforcement to really break down those three uh, notions of stationary, um, uh, something that 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 can be moved, a, a a license plate reader that can be moved around versus a license plate reader that is mounted in a motor vehicle. And uh, and looking at page R five. On the Senate language, uh, lines 2.29 um, and 2.30, uh, it says for a reader at a stationary location. So as I read that, it didn't seem to reflect a type of reader but a type of use. So I'm a little concerned with how we would dissect that. So yeah, and, just, uh, and so, Madam Chair, that would be great for law enforcement to make a note of that when they come up to, to, to talk to us about it, that they can uh, bifurcate that. All right, great, thanks. Um, I know Mr. Neumeister's time is short this morning, so I, he wants to testify, so I, uh, at his request, have uh, said that he can go first uh, this morning. Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Neumeister. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the conference committee, thank you for the few moments of your time, and thank you. I took off work, uh, and my employer allowed me to do this, to go over a very important item. Mr. Chair and conferees, Madam Chair and conferees, my name is Rich Neumeister. I am an open government and privacy advocate and have done a fair amount of work on this particular use of LPRs and also in general on use of technology by government and particularly of law enforcement. Through data requests, discussion with people nationally and all that, I'm very familiar with the aspects of LPR. So my presentation is going to be based on handouts that I've given to you to give you more information so you can make good public policy. Number two, depending on where you all go, as uh, some suggestions. And three, just how important uh, this is. Uh, let's look at section one of the Senate side. I believe this is an important section to do. Madam Chair and members of the conferees, you are very familiar with two issues. One is that it's only four years later, five years later almost, that the legislature is basically dealing with LPR technology. And it was only four, last year that Minneapolis Police Department decided to have a written policy on LPR. Bottom line is new technology is coming and compromising people's rights and civil liberties, and you, the legislature, do not know about it. The other example is the issue of stingray kingfish, particularly the one by the Department of Public Safety. Over $600,000 of public monies was used to purchase a stingray. In 2005, this started, and it was only based on folks like myself and others who where all of a sudden you are aware of this and another separate piece of legislation is moving as part of that. It's more expensive, but it tries to deal with that situation. So I very much encourage the House to accept that Senate language. There might be some little enunciations, 
But if you're going to adopt that, I also encourage because, as you may know, there is now a new legislative commission that deals with technology and privacy. I don't know the formal name of it. So the report should also go to there. And whatever the report is, that should be public. Now, the rest of the bill, that the crux of this conference committee, the key issue is, is the 99% of people scanned by Minnesota LPRs, which I contend we may have 75 to 100 at this point, don't know yet, might be more, scanned by Minnesota's LPR cameras are innocent and law-abiding Minnesotans. So what should the restrictions be and how long should law enforcement be able to retain scans that are not hits and collected on innocent people? And what should those robust safeguards and effective oversight be? And so with that, I will now start to go into the aspects of the bill. And then with the handouts. So I, I do believe you begin on, I'm, I apologize. Okay, one on one and two. So if we go on R4, and this is where the LPR language starts. I prefer the house language on this. It's the definition of what data is. Now, like I've said, I've shared with you, I've looked at a number of states and policies that have been done on the local level. Some of the policies on the local level, like Minneapolis and one or two others I've seen, they have broken down the kind of data that is collected from the LPR. And I'll go further into that on the next page. But I want to go over to the section two now in the definition of, of the Senate. They have what is known as investigative purposes, which is very broad, and I think there can be some mischief with that. I've, as you may know, I've sent each of you as conference committee members a two-page handout of my views on this, and I either hand-delivered it to you or emailed you a copy of that. If you don't have one of those, I can give it to you, or, and I know that some folks have that. So on lines 2-5, for investigative purposes. Now the issue of the purpose. Now we're going to go on to R5 on the house language, 4 through 2-6 through 431. It's very specific because you've got to remember that there's a match. So what you have, for example, and if you go to your handout, you'll see that I gave you a four-page item that explains about LPRs. This is, again, from one of my data practices requests. I got four or five handbooks on different LPR models. I wasn't going to give you 180 pages of it. But what I've given to you is a four-page thing that gives you an idea what the what people who do this technology what they're suggesting for law enforcement to use. So what happens basically, you take a picture of a plate and surrounding area, then it's matched up with some type of database, which currently in Minnesota, there are two basic kinds of databases. Primarily, most law enforcement agencies in my research are using, if you go to other, the next handout, one of the handouts, which is called which has little BCA on top. This is the Minnesota license plate data file, which the house language is very specific. So if you're going to use LPRs in Minnesota, you're going to have to match it with this database and this database only. This is how I read the house language, which defines the purpose and very much defines the use. And also you'll see more specifically in there for stolen cars, those kinds of things. Now you'll see this broad list, which is almost, this was like from two or three years ago. I, it might be 500,000 files, but right now it's 400,000 files approximately. You have uh, BCA folks here who may, might be able to tell you what really the actual number is. So they match these data set, this particular data set, 
And you match it with the LPR based on with the driver's license and name. And then what happens will be spit out some type of alert. Now the issue is, as you can see, there's warrants in there. That probably is an active criminal investigation. There are other things in there. Let's say I, there's an order of protection on me. That will also be an alert. So the issue is you have two different kinds of data sets now based on the alert. And that's why I think it's important to have some type of definition of the different kinds of sets there are. And I've talked with some of you about that. So what happens with the alert? I, Joe, police officer, what am I going to do with that alert? Some of them will be criminal investigations. They're looking for someone, a suspicious person, whatever it may be on this data set. But the other stuff is, yeah, Rich Neumeister, who is, uh, may be a, uh, have an order of protection on him, was in eight places over the last uh, six months or whatever. That is kind of some of the issues that come into play. So my suggestion to you as policymakers is go with the house language specifically on the data set because it defines the purpose more. Right now, locals can do almost any kind of data sets they want. Hennepin County has 17 separate data files. I'm, I've been trying to get what those are, but again, time, I don't have all that time to do that. And so, the, you know, and, and that's why it's important to deal with some of these things. Now, it's very, if you go back to R4, on page R4, section 2, lines 2.6 through 2.8. Again, another distinct difference between the House and Senate language. Individuals on 27, on individuals or protected non public data, if the data are or become active criminal investigation. As I stated to you in a letter that I referred to, which all of you received a copy of, is that there can be some mischief here. It's important for definition. Because what can happen in this kind of situation, this goes back, and for Senate conferees, the House members had a hearing through the uh, Chair Lesh's Civil Law Committee for about three hours uh, on this whole issue of technology and LPRs. One of the questions was asked of Chief Hartrell was, basically, and Mr. Lesh, Chair Lesh can do his own uh, comments on this, is, why do you want to do LPRs? Why do you want to retain? And her comment basically was, we don't know what we don't know. So in that kind of thinking, uh, based on the Senate language and knowing data practices and my experience with law enforcement and other entities, and what Los Angeles and some other entities are doing across the country, well, the whole, every car is under investigation. So therefore, everything is confidential. And so I encourage you to take out that language or become. It's very clear, it's very defined, and it helps again in public scrutiny and in the accountability of this kind of system. The other thing that I would like to just talk about is there are some differences between, and if there's any questions, I'm sorry. please uh, let me know. Senator Hayden. Good. Well, thank you, Madam Chair um, and Mr. Newmaster. I appreciate your you're going over the bill with us. I, I just wanted to ask you a question. The inver So if we took the section out, or the 2.6 through 2.7, it says that it's confidential data. What's the what's the inverse of that? What what is, is that what you're saying we should take that section? I, I'm just, no, I'm taking Mr. the words. Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Hayden, I suggest or become. Take out the words or become. 09, 2.7. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll give you, I'll Senator illustrate Lester. an example of this. Oh, just a second, Senator Hayden, did that answer? Well, that's question? that's helpful. I, I'd like to hear your illustration, but that's helpful. I didn't know what, where you were going with that a little bit. Uh, Mr. Neumeister. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, some people who have been around to the legislature may know about the gang strike, gang strike force. And out of element of that came with the use of gang net. What happened is information was being retained on people without any kind of definition, innocent people. Innocent people based on some associations. And when that came to light, 
that was thrown out uh, and there was issues being discussed about that. And that's one of the things I have some concerns about. You know, collection of information on people that we don't know for whatever reason and then being used in different kinds of situations. Criminal investigation data is a very defined term. It's people where you're basically preparing a case or investigating unknown or known persons. And that's where it's the importance of public scrutiny. And that some aspects of this, and there's history about this, as Madam Chair can tell you, you can be listed as a suspect very easily, particularly in another situation, because history is dictating my, my strong thing about this. Ten years ago, there was a computer database filed formed by the Minnesota Police Chiefs Association with the cooperation of all law enforcement. Had millions of records on hundreds of thousands or maybe a million Minnesotans. And people were listed in all different kinds of ways, suspects, this, based on what the locals decided to implement their data, not with a standard. Gangnet is another one. And, and so I, can, I hope the illustrations, and I, I don't want to take, but I can do it formally or informally as we, as we do some of these things. But I just want to illustrate the aspect of that. One of the other things I think is important is that there needs to be clear public scrutiny of all these things. On the stationary fixed, there are some differences between the two. Um, I have seen, and his across the country, of how surveillance is being used against certain segments of our communities in which we live in. It can be done discriminatorily, it can be done arbitrarily, and the way you see that that is not as happening is you get out as most as information as you can. On the Senate side, we're just talking about fixed cameras, for example. What you get is, to the extent possibly under Section 1337, which is security information. Now, someone who's dealt with the Act all these years, every law enforcement agency is going to say that. So if I'm trying to see if this new dragnet technology is being used arbitrarily against segments of our community, which historically technology and law enforcement has, there'd be really no way to do that. So different kinds of language and details are very important. What I want to also focus on is the rest of the handout, which I think can be helpful to illustrate some of the important things and how language is important and some of the issues that I think. Because, Madam Chair, members of the committee, if there's going to be some type of retention, whether it be 14 days, 20 days, 45 days, or 90 days, there's going to have to be some work on strong, robust, detailed safeguards and policies, which on the Senate side are weak in some areas. And so that's where some of that kinds of things, and this is why some of the handouts are helpful to you. One that you have right here is, is just came out from May 1st. This was from Wired, which is a well-known website on technology and on issues like that. What comes into play here is how Vigilant Solutions across the country, a company that does provide service LPR technology, they go to law enforcement agencies, hey, you want to buy our stuff, whatever, come into play. They have a central database of 2 billion plus of license plate scans, and a lot of them are on innocent and law-abiding people. So the issue comes into play. When I found this out, I've started making data practices requests to agencies, informally, in discussions, and I don't get direct answers. Uh, the Vigilant Solutions website does list a number of agencies here in Minnesota that have some relationship with them, I do not know. But if you look at the article even more, you will see that they have non-disclosure agreements, that they don't want information to be discussed. Very similar to the issue of Harris Corporation and the issue with the BCA, which leads to why I think it's important for that first section of the bill uh, that Senator Limmer is talking about. 
you are, if you go through the handout, you'll see the four page thing, as I indicated to you about LPRs. Now, one of the important things, and Madam Chair, and I give credit to the Senate side for adopting this language, they basically have adopted what is known as the temporary classification. As you may know, uh, Eric Roper of the Star Tribune I did a big story on LPRs. Did a focus on, I think it was 41 times how Mayor Ryback was out throughout the city, and secondly, how he as a reporter was being, again, innocent, law abiding people. And so we've got to keep this private, which I have no problem, some privacy, some aspects of this. But if you're going to have good public scrutiny and things like that, you need the public to be able to have access to that kinds of data. Now the city of Minneapolis and law enforcement, basically, Minneapolis, when they did the temporary classification, they wanted a whole lot of stuff secret. So you couldn't really tell almost anything. You review their temporary classification and their application for it. The commissioner said, uh-uh, we're going to have certain things that are always going to be public. And that language is on the Senate side where it enunciates, I think, three... Uh, Madam Chair, if uh, Mr. Guerin could just help me where that is. That's the three items that says certain things that are private. Uh, let's see on the Senate side. That's... Mr. Guerin? No, oh, there it is. It's on page R5, lines 211, 212, and 213. Now, this is one of the reasons why I think it's important that a couple of handouts that I share with you. This is Minneapolis's, or St. Paul's, which is basically through 2013 LPR summary data. And again, this is some of the differences between law enforcement agencies. St. Paul focuses a lot on stolen cars. So you can see that they got 500 in the first five months of 2013, or yeah, uh, five, oh, over over 500,000 scams on innocent law-abiding people and a certain percentage were on hits. Now they particularly focus on stolen cars. They may put other people in or whatever, but this is what I got as a summary. Now, to compare that and the list I shared with you, in 2011, Minneapolis had three million plus scans and point zero six eight were hits. Le very almost less just a little bit over a half percent. Now the other item you have here, this is from the city of Minneapolis. I got hundreds of pages of runs of scams. And this is why it's important if there's going to be some buy in by on the house side for some type of retention that these kind of information be clearly public so that I can go and get the hits and see what the hits are and I can sort of like see this is currently what I've been getting generally public from many of the agencies because of the temporary classification but I think it's important that it continue in law. So I can see how many hits they got on a certain day and then I can ask the proverbial question well what did you do with the hits? Did you arrest them? Did you do this? Did you do that? Now with Minneapolis, Maplewood, and a couple other cities and entities, it's very hard to tell. That's why one of the things that I've suggested to some policymakers, if there's going to be a buy-in, that any stop or action of or on a vehicle based on an alert must be documented pursuant to Chapter 1382, which allows for information or some information to be public. It's like you get a ticket, you get a stop, you get logs, whatever. <coughs> now, Minneapolis currently and Maplewood said they couldn't tell me. They can't dig down. And I, I waited seven months for that response almost from Minneapolis. Bloomington, they could. Mr. Neumeister, for the time period you asked for, which was about four weeks, we didn't arrest anybody or do anything with it. Could have been three weeks. But I asked, you know, I was going to ask for years and then have them do a lot of work. I could, but, you know, I'm someone who likes to take snapshots. And that's an issue that comes into play. You're gathering a lot of data, 
but I don't see where, where the accountability comes into play. The other aspect that you'll see, you'll see the database here. You know, the next article is the whole issue from the Tampa Tribune is, are we going to be using these LPRs at public events? Are we going to use them at churches and mosques and synagogues, which have been done in other communities? Are we going to be using them at political rallies? The Occupy Minnesota, where they have an entrance in and out. A group of people who believe it's in the Second Amendment. See, I, I want to both, both, so <laughs> both parties, you know, get this is important stuff. And so uh, there's been discussion in other states, other legislatures, and other things about First Amendment activities, prohibition, the process, and those kinds of things. So with the illustration of the information that I have with you, um, I just want to now summarize um, on, a, on a couple points. And then I'd like to just give a handout to you. So if this is only one, the only copy I have, but you can have. What I did is broad points to keep in mind on LPR. As you discuss some of these issues, and I like to, you can have that and copy it as you do some of the things. The, the, the unique thing that we are here historically, and I'm coming from decades of being involved intimately with legislators on policy matters when it comes into play here, that this is the first time that the conference committee is really looking at the issue of dragnet technology, mass surveillance. This is where cheap technology, it only costs a few thousand a piece, and the state is providing through the Department of Commerce. The state is funding a lot of these, also through Homeland Security, and also through cities and counties on doing these things to scoop up personal data indiscriminately of where you go. It's, and also the raw computing power. So what you do here at the conference committee will set a tone and model for the new technologies that are, that are going to be coming. And remember, information is power, and anyone who holds a vast amount of data about us has power over us. Now, one of the things that... Uh, well, I'll just take questions. I mean, I can go into more detail. I've tried to give you a broad aspect and also very knowledgeable about the detail, what law enforcement is doing, and some of the issues that come into play. All right, thank you, Mr. Neumeister. Are there any questions for Mr. Neumeister? All right, I guess not at this time. Okay. Um, so we thank you for all your work and information that you've provided for the committee. and. Uh, We'll take it into consideration. Representative Lesh. I'm sure I may have questions for Mr. Neumeister after we hear from some of the other testifiers. And you, you had stated that we're not going to complete this today. So, um, Mr. Neumeister, are, are you going to be around tomorrow uh, in the I event? will be, and I'll be here till about 9.15 or so. Tonight. Well, I don't anticipate, Madam Chair, I, I don't anticipate I'll, anticipate I'll have questions uh, prior to that, but, but probably tomorrow or before tomorrow's hearing. So thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else like to testify? Senator Limmer is here. Senator Limmer, you, uh, you can certainly join us at the table. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't mind sitting out there with the, the people's uh, chair out there either. Um, I wanted to bring your attention to page not R1. It was an amendment uh, in the Senate language that I had proposed on the Senate floor. And it's raised uh, a number of questions, uh, especially from the law enforcement community of, well, basically, what are you trying to do, Limmer? And so I thought maybe uh, uh, you all might want to have at least a perspective of why I suggested we put this type of an amendment in this bill. Uh, as you know, uh, we have had a history uh, of relatively new revelations that law enforcement has been um, uh, surveying uh, through a variety of means, uh, technical means, uh, our citizens' traffic patterns, namely license plate readers. Uh, we've heard of the uh, Kingfish um, 
scanning devices. Uh, many of these devices were used without the legislature even ever knowing they even had this equipment in their law enforcement agencies. I believe that the license plate reader had been purchased, at least the one in Minneapolis. If it hadn't been for an inquisitive reporter at the Star Tribune, uh, we may still may not have known that they even had such a thing. Uh, I believe that the uh, equipment had been purchased and had been used for over six years before uh, a, Star a Star Tribune reporter had even reported the use of that equipment. We as a legislature, in a way, are kind of blinded by the lack of information of what type of equipment uh, political subdivisions have. And if we are really the ultimate policy maker for the state of Minnesota regarding a whole host of issues, especially that of data privacy, I think we as a legislature should have a right to know what kind of equipment uh, certain law enforcement agencies are buying as they try to accumulate and observe the actions of our citizens. Now they may and I'm sure they do have legitimate reasons as they pursue individuals in, in the big fishbowl of, of all of our people. But then to, in their search, they, if there's no rules, they can continue to keep, hold, compare data on everyone else in that scan of information. Now, when I think about six years of unfettered regulation, by any government agency spying on the traffic patterns of our citizens, I'm getting a little concerned. And I believe that we as a legislature should have an opportunity to know what kind of equipment is out there. You know, when you compare, uh, and, I, and this is not really a condemnation of law enforcement. They have a difficult job. And they're trying to do it in a cost-effective way, their job, and trying to find bad guys that might be a threat to the rest of us. But when one of the challenges that we've had on any kind of issue on data privacy is that the data privacy issue is complicated simply because we have private sector industries that are continuing to just leap forward, quantum leaps in technology. And we, as a government, can't keep up. We don't know their capabilities. We don't know the newfangled invention that's now being created in some lab that can scan billions and billions of bits of information. Uh, and now it's getting to the point that you can put a camera or some device up in a hallway of an airport terminal, and you can scan faces from hundreds and thousands of feet away. Uh, there, there is even a suggestion that even drone, drone devices uh, 20,000 feet up in the air can target in on a specific Al-Qaeda target simply because of a facial recognition. Now, when you start thinking of that, and then if that keeps scanning to a wider and a wider and a wider field, pretty soon you're collecting lots of information. And if you do it over a long period of time, that information now is also um, uh, getting to the point that it can not only define who, but what is the pattern of that individual's behavior, and where do they go, and where do they come from. We're living in a different world than a few, even just a few short years away. I thought this amendment might at least, even though it, it may have been hastily uh, written during the floor debate on the Senate floor. Um, it certainly is worthy of a discussion now, perhaps uh, an application either in a different format. But it's something that we should consider because I believe um, political subdivisions have lots of opportunities. Oftentimes they get federal loans at discount rates to get the new, the new latest uh, equipment or it's a hand-me-down from the federal government, like some of the JRAPs that are now being, uh, those are armored personnel carriers that are now being becoming available from the U.S. military. Um, these have anti-tank, or not anti-tank, anti, -tank, anti 
improvised explosive device capability. It, it spreads the blast out to the sides rather than up into the vehicle. Uh, all good equipment, I'm sure, but I think maybe the legislature might want to know what political subdivisions are buying. Because quite honestly, um, there is more and more observation, and not necessarily in Minnesota so much, but we are beginning to militarize our local domestic police departments, whether we like it or not. And whether it's a real threat or a perceived threat, I can understand the policy discussion. But we in the legislature are removed from that. Uh, this, this focus for this discussion is really focused on the surveillance technology. And then what do we do with the data as we collect it? I thought this was a reminder to us that maybe what we should do is find out what equipment is out there, what are law enforcement using. Uh, I've asked, uh, at least on the Kingfish device, two, two major law enforcement agencies in the state, uh, uh, DPS and Hennepin County, one of them claimed they have written policies regarding that, and the other one says, no, we don't have any written policies regarding that. So um, that, that raises another question. If you don't have written policies, if you don't have a standard operating procedure, well, then I guess anything could, could happen. These are just maybe just musings of me, but at the same time, I think these are serious issues, and when we're collecting data on citizens, especially in the event of... Uh, the Minneapolis Police Department with license readers and to accumulate data on citizens for six years and being exceptionally quiet about having that equipment, I think it's, it should raise a caution flag to us as policymakers that we should uh, determine what kind of equipment is actively being used in our state of Minnesota. It'll be used for prosecution. It'll be used for other things. Um, I don't believe that law enforcement should just continually gather information on law-abiding citizens without any probable cause and then just accumulate and accumulate under the premise that someone in that pool of information might someday break the law. Uh, I think we should, uh, would, should wait for that probable cause determination and then give our, re our police departments all of the equipment they need to do their job. Uh, if I can stand for any questions, Madam Chair, if there are any. Senator Lemmer, are there any questions for Senator Lemmer? All right. Representative Lash. I have a question. Um, Madam Chair and, and Senator Lemmer, um, you, I think that uh, there was a pretty good explanation for, for the purposes of this, and I likewise think it's pretty important to, to get out front of this. It seems like every year... Uh, we're playing uh, catch up uh, on on not just what the technology is, but far more important, the implications, constitutional implications for its use and storage. Um, so I probably have questions for you about it, but I, I would like to hear uh, law enforcement's perspective on what kind of problems this could cause for them prior to the questions that I that I have for you. So that's more of a statement, I'm sure. All right, thank you. Uh Representative Lash. Anybody else in the audience like to testify? I'm assuming we want to hear from law enforcement. I see ACLU. Step up. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record, please. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. My name is Mark Weigel. I'm with the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office. I'm an inspector there. And um, do you want an uh, introduction to who's with me also? Uh, certainly. Okay. Madam Chair, members, Jeff Tate, Shakopee. And my name's Scott Gerlich. I'm the commander with the Minneapolis Police Department. And uh, could you state your last name again? Sure, Gerlicher, G-E-R-L-I-C-H-E-R. -E All right, thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Um, just want to start out with uh, the fact that uh, listening to the, the previous testimony from Senator Lemmer and uh, um, Mr. Neumeister that uh, we don't disagree with much of what is being said here. Uh, personally, I'm a, a Ben Franklin fan. 
Uh, I believe that uh, government needs oversight. One of the things that I deal with at the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office is I help deal with civil litigation, and so I talk a great deal there about retention of data and that we need retention schedules and that it cannot be kept forever type of thing. It, it, uh, we need to be very careful about that. That said, um, uh, this bill is very, very important to us. Uh, we believe that license plate readers are a great tool for law enforcement and for our citizens to be able to, to do investigations. And um, the, the first thing that I need to point out is that the 90-day retention schedule is very, very important to law enforcement. We believe that that is something that um, is a, a great tool for us to be able to help solve crimes. And so that's very important. Uh, the second piece is the, the Senate language. And I can point to uh, page R5. And it would be uh, 2.9 through 3.2. Um, that language, we are very supportive of that language because it, it goes into some of the things that we've been talking about here today. And, and like I said, that we in law enforcement are, are very supportive of. This language actually, uh, we believe, tightens things up to a degree that other places around the country don't even have, that this would be hopefully one of the strongest laws within the United States, possibly even internationally. Um, and it gives some protections. There is a trail. It, it does some guarantees to make sure that the, the, the data that is being accessed is uh, being done so in a proper way. And, and again, like I said, that there is a trail. Some of the things that stick out in particular is uh, that if there is reasonable suspicion, law enforcement gets some kind of an information that uh, uh, a license plate was used at the scene of a homicide, uh, and so there's a reasonable suspicion to go in and look for that data. Only certain people within the organization are able to have that access. So an investigator wouldn't necessarily have that access. The investigator would have to go to somebody within the organization um, that would be the responsible authority. They would be a, either the chief, the sheriff, or a designee of that person. They would have training um, so they know what a reasonable suspicion is. And then also, once they go in and, and access the data or check for that partial license plate or whatever it is that they're looking for, they would also, there would be a record that would be kept of that. And there would be it would be needed that there would be a case number. It would, so as we talk about an active investigation, there would be a case number, there would be a report that documents why that uh, plate was being checked for. Um, we believe that those kind of um, safeguards that are in this Senate language are very, very important, and we are very supportive of that. Thank you. Sir, anything to add? or? May I ask a clarifying question? Certainly, Senator Champion. To the testifier, can you um, uh, break down for us, or maybe uh, one of the other testifiers will 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 do so? Um, how you define like stationary versus uh, uh, stationary or fixed license plate readers, and license plate readers uh, that you relocate from time to time, and I don't know what the technical term is for those, and and how those are different from, let's say, a mobile license plate reader, just so that we can have a better sense of that, because that's one of the things that the chair asked me about, and, and how you define uh, uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, license plate readers. Inspector Regal. Uh, chair, Senator Champion, I'm going to let my cohort talk about that a little bit. Uh, Go ahead. Sure. Sure, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Champion. Uh, in Minneapolis, as I think you alluded to, sir, we do have a couple of different bridges that have fixed license plate readers. P to put it simply, those are fixed and mounted permanently on poles, whereas the other the units that we have, which, by the way, are four units total in the city of Minneapolis on police cars, marked police cars, in the entire city, those are 
mounted on police cars that can move, be moved from one squad car to another. Uh, that's really the differentiation. Certainly you could take those fixed units that are hardwired into a pole and move that, but that would take some doing, just like moving a street light to another location. I hope that maybe answers your question. Uh, Senator Champion? Uh, yes, but I thought there was a, another uh, um, license plate reader that is in between a fix and one that's mounted on a vehicle that may be, let's say for an, for, for an, an example, outside the airport, for an example, where, you know, it constantly, you know, reads license plates, but you can move that, that, that device from place to place. And am I wrong about that, or you don't have that capability? Uh, Officer Gerlicker. Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator, uh, we don't have a system like that, but they do exist. It'd be on a trailer or a type of vehicle. You may have a special event. You know, let's say we get the Super Bowl and we want to put a fixed license plate reader for a period of that week outside the new Viking Stadium. Uh, we could certainly do that. Whether that would be considered mobile or fixed, getting to that spot, it would be on wheels, uh, but the effect would be the same. Um, all right, Senator Hall. All right, Representative Lesh. Thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, Madam Chair. And this may probably be, since this is Ramsey County, uh, maybe I'd I'd ask this of Inspector Weigel. Um, if uh, if the vote on this bill was coming up, uh, say, uh, on Monday uh, on the House floor, and you wanted to determine how many, how many votes you had in favor of this measure or against it, and you, and you parked a trailer with a license plate reader outside the SOB parking ramp to determine the identities of the votes you had coming in um, on that trailer to track the license plates of the legislators. Would that be considered a fixed or a mobile reader? Dr. Weagle. Madam Chair, um, Representative Lesh, I would believe that that would be, I would consider that a fixed position. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been over here. Uh, Inspector Gerlicher, I, I was wondering about, so this, it was kind of going down the road of um, Senator Champion's question of the mounted hard, hard wire on a pole versus the device that you put into a squad and can move from squad to squad. What about the trailers that we often see throughout the city? There might be high crime areas or something happens and you mount a trailer with the, with the camera uh, involved in that. Then you, you, you take that. Are there, is that, is it just a surveillance camera or are there, could there be license or are there license plate reader technology on that? Officer Gerlicher. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Hayden. No, those are strictly public safety cameras in the city of Minneapolis. We have over 200 fixed public safety cameras mounted on poles throughout downtown and north and south Minneapolis. We also have 15 trailers you may have seen downtown. These are towed to a location. They're marked police. We put up the mast. It's got a camera. And then through our city's Wi-Fi system, we're able to monitor that. That's just visual uh, public safety camera that does not have any ALPR capability. Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. So is there, could there be uh, that capability, the license plate reader there, if you found there to, to be a need? Is there, is there ability for you to just mount the extra equipment on that trailer? Officer Gerlicher. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Hayden, uh, I would think that would be a possibility depending on the wiring and the weight of the system, but certainly you could have a specialized trailer to have license plate readers or uh, potentially co-locate it with a camera system, a regular camera system. That's a possibility certainly would exist, yes. So, Madam Chair, just as a, as a final statement, so there is this kind of infinite possibilities that we could have depending upon the technology and as the, te as the technology advances that we could have kind of fixed and then we could have them mounted and we could have them on trailers. And I mean, it just, it seems to me that the, that may not be your practice today, but there are those opportunities depending upon 
what the situation may be and what the technology looks like where you could mount those on trailers or other other things that you know I, I may not even know in order to get this information would you would you I guess you don't have to comment on that. I guess that's more of a statement, Madam Chair. Just trying to get a sense of, I know in the communities that I that I represent, I see the trailers a lot, and I've always wondered kind of what is going on, what what kind of data you're collecting, and what's what's happening, and the rationale for them to be there. So thank you, thank Madam you. Chair. Thank uh, you. Representative Lash. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, I have a, a few questions. Um, one, the explanation was offered that um, in the Senate language there was uh, um, some safeguards uh, so that uh, supervisors would uh, ensure that not just anyone could go in and get this data for the proposal. But I will be honest, that still makes me somewhat nervous. Uh, the uh, DNR employee who uh, got busted for having for scanning thousands of pictures of women and saving hundreds on his on his computer um, illegally uh, was a supervisor and in charge of compliance for the whole program uh, and so there are there are some some gaps in safeguards even in agencies where uh, we have uh, specific procedures in place uh, so I'm nervous about that uh, what uh, additional safeguards beyond simply the law as it stands uh, would you propose in your own policies that you write uh, to ensure that there is no question uh, that uh, this cannot be done outside of the approved measures and I would say this too I mean let's let's say this what if it was the uh, what if it was the police chief him or herself uh, that that was doing this or accessing this illegally what what safeguards would there be in place uh, for that eventuality? Inspector? Madam Chair and, and Representative, um, let me first state that uh, law enforcement is, is still open to looking at this and if there is some, some additional clarifying language that is suggested or that you would like that we are certainly open to, to considering anything like that. Um, frankly, I don't know if there's ever a system that will ever be totally perfect. I, you know, there's no way that we can say that there ever will be. So as you bring up a, a chief of police in a, a small department uh, that does some kind of an abuse like that, I understand, and I understand your concern. We have also talked about uh, uh, audit here, too, so there is a little bit more of a system in place as far as that is concerned. Um, in our agency, in the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, like I said, we would have a, a system that would take place where uh, the, the, the responsible authority would probably be the, the chief deputy, and the chief deputy would be the one that would say, uh, who are the people that would be able to access? And it would probably have to be a handful of, of people because of different schedules, that type of thing. Those people would have to go through training. Again, they would have to document whenever they are asked to access the system and why. They would have to be able to state that the reason why that they were being asked was substantial enough that they could go in there. The reasonable suspicion existed. When they access the data, there would be a trail of that. That information would be uh, there. And then also uh, a case number would have to be part of that trail. So there would be uh, a report, basically, and it would be documented in a report. So there's numerous different safeguards that we're talking about building into this. And if, if you don't mind, if I can go back to uh, your, your question from before, Obviously, uh, the scenario that you were, were uh, painting would be a situation where law enforcement would be overstepping their bounds in some way. Um, and this system that we're talking about here is one of those that, that helps prevent that kind of thing. So it, uh, even, if those, even if a license plate reader was parked outside of the parking ramp for the legislature, Nobody can go in and access the data without a reasonable suspicion. 
and it is all documented. So if somebody does that, that's going to be on them. They're going to end up having to deal with the, the consequences, you know, whether that is uh, uh, any kind of uh, action within the agency as far as, as uh, you know, having to, to deal with them disciplinary action. So I, I don't know if that answers that question from before, though, too. Well, uh, Madam Chair, Chair you know, I, absolutely that my question was a rhetorical question, if no. of course. Um, and uh, I have uh, full confidence that none of the individuals sitting up at the table of there would, would ever try something like that. But um, having worked as a prosecutor for uh, going on 13 years now, um, I, uh, I have met a small, small percentage of, of, of officers who uh, perhaps uh, wouldn't uh, hesitate to do something like that if they thought it was it was in a certain interest, and that's what has me concerned. So all is it all it takes is is one person uh, to overstep the bounds to really break down the confidence that the public has, and I really don't want us to ever ever uh, go near that. Um, and if I could, Madam Chair, I would ask um, uh, uh, Officer Gerlicker, uh, is that are you? Lieutenant, uh, Commander, I'm sorry. Commander, sir. Commander, Commander Gerlicker. Because um, we, I never got this, uh, this information before, but um, prior to the distribution of the data, before the temporary agency designation through IPAD um, in 2012, um, what was the discussion in your department about the sensitivity of the information. When did it begin to come to light that this information uh, was easily, well, was a legally obtainable? Um, and was there any action uh, taken or, uh, about that? Or was it just all of a sudden out of the blue, you get a data practice request from uh, the Star Tribune for two million records and, and there's a reaction to it? Was there discussion about this data prior to that time? And uh, and if so, what was that discussion? Commander Gerlicher. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Les. Um, my recollection of that is that there was some discussions about the data, but generally, uh, until we received data practices requests, there wasn't any significant discussion. Certainly, uh, we believe the data should be kept confidential um, as a temporary classification is done in most cases. Um, but uh, our position, I think, is that, uh, again, this is not data that we want the general public to have. It's sensitive data even within, in our opinion, law enforcement. And to kind of dovetail on that and what was said by Ramsey County here as well, maybe I could summarize for you some of the accountability accountability measures we have in place already in Minneapolis. You may or may not be familiar with the help kind of address some of those concerns with regards to access to the data, who can get it, etc. cetera. Um, right now, of the 800 sworn Minneapolis police officers, there's less than 20 people on our police department that have access to go in and pull out the type of data that we're talking about here today. Those are individuals that work for me up at our Strategic <coughs> Information Center. In order to do this, you have to have the software on your computer. It's not a web-based system. Um, contrary to some of the issues that have come forth in the past with DVS, you can't just be sitting at home, plug in your password and obtain this data. You have to be at your city computer with the software activated, logging in through their, the secure network to our server to make an inquiry about a particular license plate. Now, within the state of Minneapolis, we use PIPS technology and BOSS as our back office software system. We took an extra step with our software in the state of Minneapolis so that any time one of my staff wants to run a license plate uh, for an investigative purpose, when they plug in the license plate number they want to run and they hit find, a dialog box pops up and they have to list what is your justification for running this license plate. And there's some pre-selected boxes, could be data practices, or could be case investigation, could be a number, three or four different options. And then there's some uh, notes page, if you will, where they can put in uh, per request from Sergeant Smith in the homicide unit, 
adding in a case number. All that information is recorded in the system. There's an audit trail so that we can pull up a report after the fact to see who's accessed that, how many times. Um, those are some accountability measures we put in place proactively uh, that weren't necessarily part of the system that we purchased, but we did so uh, because we want to have responsible policies and practices as well. Nobody likes to see some of the issues that have come up in the past with our other statewide databases. So it's a system that has very limited accessibility. All the individuals who access that have training not only how to use it, but also on the proper use of it. As you know, we have policies in place for the use of that. And there's an audit trail for us to determine who's accessed the data and, and why. Madam Chair. Chair Lush. Commander Gerlicher, did the City of Minneapolis um, at any time uh, either receive or solicit an opinion from uh, your city attorney on the uh, proper use of this technology um, or the constitutionality of its application prior to putting it into service? Commander Gerlicher. Um, I can't speak to that one way or the other. I was not involved at the time the initial purchase of this equipment was made. I know we've had extensive conversations with our city attorney's office since that time uh, about the fact that, again, this type of information should be used for very strict investigative purposes. Again, the city of Minneapolis and myself personally worked with the city attorney and went to the state of Minnesota Department of Admin and got a state approved retention schedule of 90 days, which is in place currently. Um, so we have had a lot of dialogue with the city attorney, um, but my personal recollection doesn't go back. I, again, wasn't part of the initial purchase of the equipment when we when we got it. Okay. Well, Chair Lush. Madam Chair, and the reason I ask is uh, I don't think you're alone, uh, Commander Gerlecker, in, in being in a situation. You know, whether it's a, another uh, law enforcement agency or even another government agency that has a new tech. Uh, a kind of technology they can place into the field. Um, asking the questions about whether it could get out of hand, whether it's public under Chapter 13, or whether it's constitutional, isn't necessarily your wheelhouse. Your wheelhouse is catching bad guys, and um, and if I was in your shoes, that's the same thing uh, that I would do. But that's kind of why I think um, Senator Limmer's amendment that he talked about might be apropos here because. Um, there are folks in this body and other locations that do think about that, and that's all they do. Um, and we want to really, as much as is possible, minimize the number of situation, situations where this technology gets out in front of us. So we're not uh, doing consideration in retrospect and going to the city attorney afterwards um, uh, just because it, it, I, am, I am personally amazed at the level of complication that we have gotten to with respect to this technology and the things that we can do. Um, I also wonder uh, the justification at the front end, and I may consider this as well if I was uh, an officer on the street, is, well, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy of, of your license plate. Um, uh, therefore, we're good. Um, but that's, that's not the analysis. I mean, that may be the first blush analysis, but that is certainly not the analysis overall because the analogy here we're talking about is uh, not just happening to see a license plate as you're on patrol, but, um, but following someone around, effectively following someone around. And the Supreme Court alluded to that um, in, uh, in U.S. v. Jones in, in January 2012. So, um, so that I, I want us, Madam Chair, to have more conversation about about uh, Senator Limmer's amendment, um, and I notice we don't have uh, um, the other third member of the House side here. Um, but if I could ask one more question at this point while we have law enforcement up here, um, is there, for, for any of you, is there a departmental policy regarding the use of HIT data? Uh, when you get uh, a uh, plate on the wrong car, uh, registered owner comes back as revoked or suspended or canceled or canceled lips, um, one of those situations that, that falls into the house language anyway, um, is there 
is there a, a, a required procedure that you have to follow uh, with respect to being in receipt of that information? Or is at that point everything just simply officer's discretion? Who wants to take Madam Chair, members, anytime one of our officers gets a hit, as you mentioned, a revoked driver, uh, for example, on a license plate read, they have to then go back and pull up additional information and confirm that that driver, because the LPR is going to tell us who's driving that vehicle at that time, they have to go back, uh, just as they would if they randomly uh, ran a license plate, go back and then determine does that driver uh, match the physical description based on the registered owner and take subsequent action uh, whether or not that uh, driver matched those physical descriptions. Well, Chair Lush. Madam Chair, the reason I'm asking is I could be wrong on this, but uh, just based upon what I can see, now we don't have anyone here from St. Paul, but uh, the information uh, submitted by Mr. Neumeister uh, suggests that there, in fact, was not very much follow-up at all on the hit data. Uh, so I'm trying to, and you can't answer for St. Paul's data, um, and there's no one here from St. Paul. Um, so I'm wondering if, if for example, uh, is it Chief Tate or, okay, Chief Tate, um, if I, if I ran this this data for Shakopee, would it show similar numbers? That there, in, in fact, is not significant follow-up at all on the hit data uh, for your LPR plate images. Chief Tate. Madam Chair, members, I can give you an example of, uh, of a recent somewhat recent incident where one of our officers uh, received a hit on a, on a license plate uh, from our reader, obtained additional information, pulled them over, the driver was revoked or suspended, had a warrant, something of that nature. By the time the officer had gone up, got the driver's license, checked for insurance or information, come back to his car, he had seven more hits from vehicles going by. So there's seven hits that would show up on our, you know, if somebody were to go back in and look at how many hits you had versus how many non-hits you had. There's seven hits in there that are going to show absolutely no follow-up, for one example. Another example, um, to use, you know, some of the testimony earlier uh, regarding an active order for protection. If I am driving and I get a, a hit, an alert that the registered owner has an active order for protection. There's only one person in the car. I don't need to do any more follow-up because there's no violation, whether or not the registered owner is the, is the person driving or not. So that kind of information is officer discretion. There's no reason to go any further than just the alert. You have to do something extra to, to uh, stop that individual or stop that vehicle. Okay. Thank you. No, Thank no further questions at this time, Madam Chair. I have a, a question about the designation of security data. We see it um, at, in the Senate language uh, on uh, page R6 uh, at the end, let's see, like 315, 16, 17. And five, six years ago, I used to talk about the Mack truck exception of investigative data and how uh, law enforcement could say that this was investigative data in order to keep it confidential and outside of the ability of the data subjects to access it. Now uh, the more recent trend or Mack truck exception that we're seeing is uh, taking surveillance type data, large data sets, and I'll give an example, I don't know if it's still being applied this way, but uh, data collected at the Mall of America being shared with the Bloomington Police Department uh, in um, blanket form being classified as security data um, as a condition of the sharing back and forth between uh, security uh, entities at the Mall of America and turning then their information um, not governed by the Data Practices Act to the Bloomington Police Department. And so as I look at the language that the Senate has, around location of these uh, 
of these readers, I can see an instance where all locations could easily be defined as security data, and hence you wouldn't have any disclosure. Can you give me examples of locations of readers that would not be uh, security data? Um, Madam Chair, if I could uh, ask for a little bit of help from one of my colleagues here. We allow phone a friend here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> But it does, we'll see who's going to answer the phone here. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record, uh, please. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the Assistant Superintendent at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, Madam Chair. Uh, members, I, I think that's a valid question. I think that uh, we're looking at security information data classification that we try to use that very sparingly. It, it would really... I hate to use the word depend, but it would depend on the actual location of the um, reader and, and what the purpose of that reader would be. If it would provide information that would compromise um, the, the security of our citizens, there might be a situation where we would. But we've had this discussion within the Department of Public Safety. We would like to use security information declarations very sparingly and uh, uh, for the reason that you stated that it's not overused. Um, to protect data that shouldn't be protected, that should be designated as public or retain its classification under the Data Practices Act. Uh, and, and to just further illustrate that point a little bit, I think it goes to some of the questions Senator Champion had um, concerning fixed versus stationary versus mobile technology. I do think there's a difference between all three. When I consider fixed location, I think it's a situation as was described that would be very difficult to move, such as being as fixed to a bridge deck um, where that is more of a, or less a relatively permanent location as opposed to something that we're on a trailer or mounted in a situation that would be deployed where we have significant security concerns such as a um, high-risk security event or part of an active criminal investigation. And so I think it would really depend on how that LPR is being used in the given context. Well, you haven't really made me feel any better because you talk about how you'd like to see this security classification used sparingly, but I think the use of this is exploding as a, as a classification. Um, and, and it's not all, I don't fault law enforcement because quite frankly, we at the legislature have struggled with having appropriate classifications or how we deal with surveillance da data in general, you see the license plate reader bill before us, which is a, a, a subset or a component of surveillance data in a very high-tech fashion, but we also have surveillance data in a very low-tech fashion that's collected on individuals, uh, suppositions, uh, um, some of the gang net things that we saw with uh, police, uh, um, public safety, collecting information on affiliations or uh, places that people went, et cetera, law-abiding people that was then stored in electronic uh, databases for access. So I, I, I don't bring this in, a, in an effort to badger or, um, or cause problems. I'm raising it as an issue because I, I what used to uh, raise concerns when I would see investigative data uh, again recently using security data as a classification. Um, it makes me nervous because I think that it's just a broad exception and even by your testimony a high security event to bring in a mobile unit as I look at the Senate language around uh, location of that technology my guess is is that at first blush law enforcement would deem the location of that mobile unit at a high security event as security information and not disclose its use. And so I, I, I don't know if we have to look at language that says, you know, within 10 days after event is over or, I mean, I, you know, I don't know where we go with this, but just for the Senate, I know what you're trying to accomplish, but I'm not comfortable uh, with the language as it sits because I think there's a lot of room for abuse mm -hmm. of that. So any other questions of the um, gentlemen that are at the table? I, so, uh, the House goes in at 10. By a show of hands, can I see how many more people want to testify on this bill so I can for time purposes kind of... Okay. Um, uh, Chair Lash. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so the the House bill says has zero days retention, which solves our problem. And we're talking about two different data sets here: the hit data, which you talked about, and the non-hit data. And the House's major issue last year related there are a whole series of questions that should be asked with respect to the hit data, how it's used, and everything like that. And the analysis is very similar, sorry, very similar to the analysis that we use for normal investigations, because you got your reasonable suspicion, at which point you'll have your probable cause. The non-hit data um, is another issue entirely, and it is uh, relatively a, a new analysis. Um, the House language uh, states uh, you can't use it, you can't retain it. The Senate uh, language is very different to the extent that, well, yeah, you can use it as long as someone's supervising you in the police department. Um, and this, I think, <clears throat> I can't think of a situation where we've done something like this uh, similar, and maybe those uh, testifying uh, can, can correct me on that, um, but it is the desire of the uh, of law enforcement to make use of this data set uh, for folks upon which you currently have uh, no reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Therefore, normally in that situation, under the typical other analysis of a law enforcement investigation, we would say, <coughs> okay, well, in order to investigate that person, you got to get a warrant. What, what is wrong with a law enforcement agency for going into that data set of individuals who are innocent because they have not been proven guilty, uh, what is wrong with going outside the department? This would alleviate a, a problem uh, similar to the DNR issue. Going outside the department to a judge uh, who signs off on your explanation. Uh, because as it stands right now, uh, your requirement of having an existing case file uh, case number um, and investigation um, would still be within the department and we'd run into those same administrative issues that we've had with the DNR and other government agencies where this um, uh, data safety becomes incredibly porous and causes problems for us. Uh, uh, what's wrong with getting a warrant for this? Uh, Commander? Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Lesh, Again, the data that we're talking about is data that's taking place on public streets. Therefore, it really doesn't fit the criteria for getting a warrant, which is going into someone's house or onto their property. So in the law as it is written today, it really doesn't match. But to give you an example of how valuable, you've heard all sorts of examples, I'm sure, of the value of the non-hit data. And to us on the Minneapolis Police Department, the non-hit data is of extreme value to us. And um, just to give you a brief example, I was a homicide detective, so we get a shooting north Minneapolis. Let's say it's a particularly vicious shooting. We have a kid that's killed. Okay, so I'm a homicide detective. I go to the scene of that north Minneapolis. One of the things that I do as a detective is I ask the responding officers, I want you to canvas the area. So I ask the officers to go from house to house to talk to individuals. I ask them to walk up and down the block to write down the license plates of every vehicle parked on that block or within a certain area. That is data that's out there available. That's data that may and very well could prove and has proven useful after the fact in the case of a homicide. With the case of a license plate reader system, this is now, we're able to do this in a much more effective and quick method. So we have the same situation now, a homicide taking place in North Minneapolis. Now I can dispatch one of my squad cars that's equipped with a license plate reader. All they have to do is drive up and down the streets in a three or four block grid pattern. They've now captured photographs and license plates of every vehicle parked within that particular area. So why is that of value? It may be of no value today. But my people aren't going in and querying and looking at every vehicle that was parked there. What they're doing is, after the fact, 30 days, 60 days, however long after, you may develop a suspect. Maybe as part of that, the suspect, um, you know, you have somebody pointing to the fact that he was in the area, they saw him with a gun. You get him in custody, you're doing an interrogation of the suspect. 
He says, that wasn't me. I wasn't in an area. I wasn't even near there. Oh, really? Well, now we have a license plate of his vehicle that may have been parked a half a block away at the time of that homicide. That's just a hypothetical example of the type of value that the non-hit data can, can provide to law enforcement. It's been proven time and time again in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, across the country, and that non-hit data, retaining it for a reasonable period of time, is critical to law enforcement. Without having any retention in the non-hit data, the effect of this tool goes way down. Uh, I'm wondering if, if the other, um, well, if, uh, if Chief Tate could maybe give an answer. Chief Tate. Why, Chair, why no warrant? Members, uh, I would concur with the commander's comments that, I mean, this is a, a photograph of a license plate on a public road. In terms of getting a warrant, uh, that I believe that's public information uh, th that we could obtain. The, uh, I, we have similar examples where we've had in the last 12 months two homicides in the city of Shakopee. For a city our size and strength of our office, our, our staff, we're not going to be able to get all that information within 24 hours. <coughs> we need um, that retention period for this data. Once you start talking to suspects and you find out well, oftentimes they're not driving a vehicle registered to them. It's somebody else's. It may be a girlfriend's. And oftentimes, the few times we have gone back in and, and run a plate to see if we've come across it at a specific area, um, they've, it's been because we've obtained information after the fact, 48 hours or so after a, after a major case. Okay, Chair Chair. Chair. So what I what I heard from uh, Commander Gerlacher and Chief Tate is uh, is two things. Um, number one, uh, it's that it's uh, it's not the same thing as a warrant because this is uh, uh, an image of uh, of a uh, plate on a street. Uh, and number two, that it's really useful to to solve crimes. And let me ask one other question uh, of of Commander Gerlacher. Commander Gerlacher. Uh, what would be the cost, what would have been the cost to the City of Minneapolis Police Department in terms of labor and resources to collect uh, 2 million license plate images in June of 2012 without the technology? What would it have cost you uh, to have police on the street to uh, write down all those uh, plate images and uh, aggregate them into a database? Commander. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Lutz, I would imagine to try to go and handwrite all those plates would be very significant cost. You, get, you can't put a number to that. I'd be uncomfortable doing that, but obviously I think the question answers itself. It would be extremely labor-intensive process uh, and an expensive process to do that. Would, Madam Chair, uh, Commander Gerlacher, would it have even been uh, fiscally in any way possible for the, for the Minneapolis PD, PD to do that? Commander Gerlacher. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Liss, uh probably not, no. Right. Thank you. So um, two things, um, I guess, in, re in, in response to both of those, those responses, that it's really useful to solve crimes. I have no reason to doubt you whatsoever. I'll, this is, this is, I'll bet there are ways that this is useful that we haven't even imagined yet. And just the ways that you described of how useful it is, um, I absolutely believe you. Uh, but there are other ways... Um, the other things that we could do uh, to citizens that would be useful to solve crimes too. We could microchip everybody, and that would be incredibly useful in solving crimes. We could track them down, find out who they're talking to at any given point. It would be a phenomenal tool to fight crime. Uh, but there are reasons that we don't do that, at least now. Um, uh, <laughs> the second uh, thing is that you say that um, it's not the same as a warrant because a warrant is like walking into someone's house or uh, invading their privacy, um, their reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and so I would ask some other rhetorical questions on this point, but I'm not going to. I'm just kind of going to explain. Um, if, if you, uh, Commander Gerlacher, for example, have Internet at your home, you certainly probably would have a reasonable expectation that, that is private. Um, but what about the person 
who, let's say, doesn't secure their Wi-Fi network with a password. Anyone can come by and hop on that Wi-Fi hotspot and find out which websites um, they've been going to. A police officer could go by and, and park their car outside that person's house um, and hop on their, their Wi-Fi network and find out uh, what websites they've been visiting. Now, the normal person in a house um, expects that their internet traffic uh, is, is not being followed everywhere they go. Yet at the same time, they wouldn't necessarily have a reasonable expectation of privacy if they didn't put a security uh, password on their Wi-Fi network. Um, but if you told the average person out there, well, hang on a second, I'm a police officer, your Wi-Fi network's open for anyone to see, you should have known better. Well, it's like telling the average person, you should have known better. You could look at your license plate anywhere you went, so therefore we have uh, uh, the ability to track where you go, uh, who you've, uh, what, what locations you've been to, how often you go there, whether you go, like the Supreme Court has said, whether you go to church, whether you go to synagogue, whether you go to a massage parlor in downtown Minneapolis, whether you're a late-night clubber. All this kind of information the Supreme Court has said is not necessarily uh, uh, information that's in the public interest. Uh, this, is, this is why I think it's really important that we, we talk about this, and I think we're going to have a disagreement that it's not the same as a warrant. Uh, uh, and I think the Supreme Court has said that as well. So I'd like us, Madam Chair, to kind of have a more open discussion about that. It's what's being talked about nationally right now. I fully uh, understand law enforcement's uh, perspective on that. And in fact, if I was sitting in the, the boots of, of these gentlemen up there, I'd, I'm sure I would say the same thing. Um, but I'm saying something different now because I'm on this side of the table. So I hope we can address that when, when other people are at the table as well. All right, thank you, Chair Lesh. And given that we got at least three more people who want to testify on floor session in 22 minutes, I think we'll take more testimony. And Madam Chair, can I just... Sure, Senator Hayden. Well, and maybe this isn't just the right time, and, and I, I don't know if the law enforcement folks will be back as we do this, but I, I guess the, the question I would ask or would want to get a response from you guys is that there's this kind of hypothetical theme, and so I haven't engaged in this as much as some of my esteemed colleagues here and most certainly uh, uh, the chair of our committee and, and others that have really thought about this a lot. So I come at it kind of broader and uh, as much more as a neophyte. But there's this underlying hypothetical, Madam Chair, of, well, something like we got the information and then something if something happens, then we could use it to figure out what that might be or you know a, a commander you said somebody uh gets shot in, in north minneapolis and and um and that we you know kind of canvas this and then at some point if we catch somebody we could kind of go back grab the data to see if they're in the area can you guys give me a sense of how many or in general how many crimes you have solved using you know beyond the hit data the revocation and that kind of stuff but how many crimes do you solve using this technology because what it what what i hear is this infinite possibility that we could do it if everything lines up but really how how useful has it been in in solving uh crimes that have happened in your uh your your, your respective cities commander um, yeah madam chair uh senator hayden I can't put a number on it. It's not a daily occurrence where this tool by any means is solving crimes. I did bring with a couple examples that I'd be happy to share with anybody. Uh, in one case that it solved a homicide, another it solved a burglary case through the use of ALPR. Uh, but to put a number on it, you know, um, is, is difficult sitting here right now. I would say that in a, in a dozen range, dozens in the past uh, year or two that I've been part of the, uh, uh, in my position. So, so Madam Chair, for, the, for time's sake, I just really think that that's helpful because what I'm trying to weigh as we start to get into the details of this is, and I think the larger issue is, you know, this, this idea of how much intrusion do we put on citizens and how much do we follow them and how much data do we collect versus what we get in return from a public safety standpoint. 
And then we as legislators have to kind of weigh that and put some parameters. And so I, I think it's helpful as you guys, and I, and I do appreciate this, the seat that you're in and the, the great work that you do to keep us all safe. But I do think that it is important for us to get a, an understanding of, you know, um, I think Mr. New, Newmeister and others talked about the, the, the local civilian law enforcement, or what, what I'm saying non, as non-military, being more militarized in terms of what we do and how much surveillance we have on people and what the threat is out there so that we can all be safe. And I think it's really helpful if you guys do return, or as we have further conversations, Madam Chair, that we really drill down there a little bit for me because that's what I'm trying to get my arms around is, you know, how how do we use it? And I do, uh, Commander, um, think about this a lot because there's plenty of those trailers that pop up in my district, um, and I always kind of wonder why. Like, I always think something must have happened, um, but maybe that's not always the case. And then I always want to know, like, well, what are they collecting and why, and then how has that helped you uh, keep the peace? So I, I just think that that's really important, uh, M Madam Chair, as we think about this issue. Thank you, Senator Hayden. Uh, gentlemen, maybe a little homework. So at this point, we're going to move on um, to other testifiers. Uh, Mr. Gamberling? Madam Chair, could I share just a couple of real quick concerns? I'll take two minutes just on, on DPS's perspective on just a couple provisions. Um, Would you like certainly. to Certainly. Uh, uh, the, the couple provisions that we just wanted to raise from the Department of Public Safety um, are a couple of them. Number one being the uh, inventory of surveillance technology I just want to raise for the members to consider. Uh, we certainly understand. I listened to Senator Limmer's um, intent behind this amendment. As written, it is extremely broad, and we have significant concerns um, with that particular uh, provision as to what that would mean if that information was public on disclosing every piece of our surveillance technology. And in particular, particular, I'd be very concerned for the safety of my agents and confidential informants and other persons in relation to that. The intent behind it is, is understandable. We'd just like to have continued um, discussions. Uh, Representative Lesh offered a uh, amendment that, that he pulled uh, on, an, on a uh, technology committee, and that is our concern, that that information we public. I don't think that we have concerns about informing our legislature, obviously, on the tools that we're utilizing and how we're utilizing them. Um, I'd be concerned, though, for the safety of our officers, our agents, throughout the state if that was a, a public document that was published on surveillance technologies. The second item is uh, the in the Senate language, um, I believe it's on page um, page R5, uh, the Senate language concerning the audits. It, it uh, indicates the Department of Public Safety will conduct the audits of these systems. I just want to raise for the uh, uh, members that this is uh, something that is obviously needed, that audits need to be conducted these systems. However, these are generally right now proprietary systems that are purchased and owned by local law enforcement throughout the state. We do a significant number of audits, but we audit our systems that we own at the BCA. And in order for it to be meaningful, um, we don't have the ability currently to audit those systems. And so uh, we would believe it'd be more meaningful for the local agencies to conduct those audits. And then lastly, I, I do agree with uh, the, the provisions we've talked about, perhaps defining fixed versus stationary versus mobile might be helpful in that different data classifications may be considered as you've discussed, Madam Chair, so that we do not use overuse uh, security information, that we specifically uh, classify the data related to those three different technologies, perhaps in different mechanisms. Um, stationary, if you were as part of an active criminal investigation, there may be a need not to disclose the location of that. However, a fixed uh, uh, device, I can see the value in, in having that as a public information and uh, post which agencies um, possess these devices. We've had conversations with the Safe at Home program at the Secretary of State's office. Their indication is they just want to know which agencies um, possess these devices so that uh, participants in that program can contact those agencies, not necessarily know the fixed location of each of these devices. All right, just real quickly, as long as you opened it up, uh, do you believe that law enforcement has the authority to sign non-disclosure agreements while related to the technology that they purchase and employ? I, I will answer the question, Madam Chair. I, I didn't intend to open that up, but we do have non-disclosure agreements related to some of our technology. Typically, the non-disclosure agreements uh, revolve around uh, uh, proprietary information by the companies and that they are trying to protect uh, to uh, protect their particular technology in a given field. 
Oh, you, you didn't exactly answer my question. Mm -hmm. Do you believe law enforcement has the authority to sign non-disclosure agreements uh, when they're purchasing or deploying uh, technology? I, I think law enforcement, not just necessarily technology, we do sign non-disclosure agreements um, and, and uh, believe we have the authority to with a variety of technologies um, and uh, that we employ, not necessarily surveillance technologies or limited to surveillance technologies. And what authority then do you believe uh, you have to sign non-disclosure? I think it's inherent in our authority as a, a executive branch agencies to enter into contracts with various companies um, that uh, we are um, contracting with to for, for a variety of services, whichever it may be. However, I, I would tend to agree that then we need to examine those non-disclosure agreements in relation to the Data Practices Act and that it continues to apply even in relation to our non-disclosure agreements that we may have. Well, and the premise is, is that all contracts are public. And we see this proliferation now of law enforcement signing non-disclosure agreements when they're purchasing or using various technologies. And I, they haven't, at least in my mind, done a very good job explaining where their authority is to uh, make a certain uh, contract, some in their entirety, unavailable for public scrutiny. Are they, you know, I expect that we might be going down the security data uh, black hole um, if if we are we push uh, for an explanation. Um, current law allows for trade secrets and other items to be not disclosed, uh, but it looks like we have this trend now, and I'm just curious I, what your thoughts on that are because we're we're trying to get sunshine into this whole thing, and at every turn. We find that law enforcement is, in many instances, for good reason, using uh, portions of the data practices law that were never um, put into place for these purposes. They're, they're hanging their hats, if you will, on security data or cookie language or all these kind of really weird uh, twists and turns of Chapter 13. And I don't think it's serving anybody's purposes very well. And so as we're working through kind of this issue, I'm trying to get your perspective uh, on where these lines should be as far as public need to know and disclosure and... and um, I, I would agree with you, Madam Chair, that the, the contracts continue to be public information unless one of the, uh, the the various provisions of the Data Practices Act applies. We haven't used that in terms of some of our surveillance technology. Um, um, I think probably what you're referring to is our cellular exploitation technology in which we've held back some of the information related to that. And we've used the deliberative process um, provision of the Data Practices Act in that situation and, some, and the trade secret information for various portions of that. However, we've answered many questions related to that technology that we could and we've tried to go through very specifically and release the information we could on that particular technology without compromising the integrity of that and protecting the safety of Minnesotans uh, while we use that technology. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mr. Gamberling. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Gamberling. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Don Gimberling. I'm with the Minnesota Coalition on Government Information, which is dedicated to government accountability, sunshine, transparency, etc. I know most everybody at the table pretty well, except for Senator Hayden and Senator Champion. Uh, my state career can be divided into two parts. I worked for the state for about 36 years. I spent five years working on criminal justice information systems. That was my first real job. I taught cops how to use those systems. Okay? I helped design those systems. I wrote training manuals. I spent a lot of time with law enforcement. The balance of my career was spent working with issues of fair information practices, which is the, the derivation of the name of the Data Practices Act, and issues of government accountability through Sunshine, Freedom of Information. Okay? In that role, I spent a lot of time training government agencies, including law enforcement, on how to comply with the statutes and how to deal with difficult issues. That's my background. That's my professional background. My personal background is one of a person who has been politically active for years, active in the anti-war movement, active in the civil rights movement, 
and who's been surveilled by the government on occasions. Okay? And I like to think I was always surveilled when I was carrying on lawful activities like exercising my rights under the First Amendment. As you can probably tell, I have some strong feelings about these issues. Okay? What you're looking at with these kinds of bills is the latest iteration in a discussion that's been going on in this country, particularly since the late 1960s, on how you control bad actors in the government. Okay? I agree with much of what you've said and much of what the folks who appeared at this table before me have said about, you know, there are a lot of good guys out there. I like to think most people in law enforcement are good guys. But the question always is, what do you do about the bad guys? And we have a history of bad guys, okay? I won't take you back to 1966 uh, and earlier, because you can go back a lot earlier to things like red squads in police departments who spent a major amount of time not keeping an eye on communists, but keeping an eye on labor leaders like Walter Ruther, the president of the, of the United Auto Workers. So the question is always going to be, how do you control bad behavior? Well, in Minnesota, you passed a law back in 1974 called the Data Privacy Law. Okay? And it was based on some principles developed by a, a high-level panel of people whose whole idea was to find some ways of making organizations accountable for the information they collect and use on people. Okay? Now, one of those principles, and it's a relative to part of what you're talking about today, is a principle that says we should never have information systems that are totally secret, that nobody even knows about. And why was that principle established? Because we had a history of information systems developed at the federal level and other levels of keeping information secret from the public. And what do we know about secrecy? Secrecy promotes excess, and it often promotes corruption. Okay. So what you did is you put some things in the Data Practices Act to limit the secrecy that's possible. And part of what I'm always amazed at after all the years I've been doing this is having people come up here, and it's not a new, new, new issue to me, and tell, tell you that they have only very recently put into place some policies and procedures that they've been required to put into place for years and years and years. Okay. So part of what you're trying to do, I think, and what I hope you're trying to do, is you're trying to focus attention on these things because attention not only helps you make policy, but it helps bring about changes in people's behavior. Okay? I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Senator Limmer's amendment on the Senate floor to essentially require an inventory of surveillance technology. If you go into the Data Practices Act and its implementing rules, you'll find that there's a requirement that government agencies list all of the data that they collect and maintain on people that they regard as not public in, a, in an inventory. And that inventory was first required in 1980. An update to that inventory is required every year under statute. And I suspect if you go from agency to agency, particularly law enforcement agencies, You'll find very few of those inventories that are in place, and you'll find even fewer that are, uh, that are up to date. Okay? What's the purpose of the inventory? It's to make sure we don't have any secret systems. Okay? Your thought was, if we give visibility to this stuff, then people will react to its existence. Okay? But if government agencies don't do what they're supposed to do, uh, then and as some of you know, and I won't get my broken record speech, the ultimate issue always is how do you get compliance, okay? I appreciated Representative Lesh's questions about what was the mental process that the Minneapolis Police Department went through when they put this system into place and began using it, okay? Now, Senator Limmer says that was for six years, and I, frankly, I don't know how long it was. I know it was at least two or three years. And then suddenly, because a reporter comes in, and says, so I understand you got this database, can I look at it? Suddenly there's this whole flurry of activity and people are all focused on, well, we, we can't have this out going out to the public. Well, it was already going out to the public because it was public under the Data Practices Act. And that produced the application for temporary classification. So 
What I hope you do in all of this stuff is find better ways to get them to pay attention to your policy. Okay? Because part of my job, as I saw it when I worked for the state, was this is your policy. You are the people's elected representatives. A bureaucrat like me, a police chief, other people like that, you know, we're, we're the instruments of your will, as it were. Okay? We carry out your policy because you get elected to make the policy. And so the more scrutiny you can give to these issues, the better off things are going to be. Okay? Now, I have some detailed issues, and I can share them with you at some other time. But um, there's a lot of good things in both these bills, but I see some technical problems. And I, and I always find it hard to get out of the role of the technician person who looks at the little pieces and says, for example, a uh, quick example, you got this report uh, in, uh, on surveillance technology from Senator Limmer that goes to the chairs in, in the committees. Well, what you want to do for sure is amend that if you keep it to make sure that that report goes to the new Data Practices Commission. Okay? That was signed into law by the governor, and congratulations, Representative Holberg and other people who worked on it. So, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But in, in summary, as you put things in this bill, or you keep things in this bill, that focus on things like policies and procedures within an agency to make sure that your policy, public policy, that you want to carry out is, is obtained, keep in mind, there's got to be some way to do that. There's got to be some way to check on that. And when I hear law enforcement agencies say, well, the best way to do this is to have them audit themselves. For I get real problems with that. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful Latin phrase, and I'm no good at Latin. I barely graduated from college because I was no good at languages. <coughs> that, and I can't do it in Latin. It's much better in Latin. But you've all heard this phrase, I think. The phrase goes something like this. Who guards the guards themselves? Okay. It was a comment by a Latin scholar about the Praetorian Guard in ancient Rome, which after being created to protect the empire, turned into a political uh, organization that essentially decided who the emperor was. And when they didn't like something the emperor did, they killed him, killed him off. Okay. So what you're really thinking about and talking about here, and I commend your efforts, is who guards the guards themselves. And who does that in the most effective way possible? If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Gambrilli? All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Wasn't our intent that we would reconvene if we can get our testimony done this morning? So. Okay. Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Benjamin Feist. I'm the Legislative Director for the ACLU of Minnesota. I'll keep my comments very brief this morning. I believe um, most of the points that I was going to bring up has been, have been brought up either by the committee members themselves uh, or through the other testifiers. I simply want to be on the record that the ACLU of Minnesota supports the House position on the principled basis that we don't believe you should be keeping uh, data on innocent individuals just in case they do something wrong in the future. Um, to the extent that we are getting away from that and that a compromise um, is reached where there, there is a period of retention, uh, we believe that judicial oversight really makes sense uh, as the way to make sure that these, this sensitive information is protected. Um, we've had conversations with law enforcement and I believe that they have um, acted in good faith to try to work out some of these issues so far, and I hope that they will uh, continue to do so. Um, but with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions?